and welcome to Dispel Magic, the podcast where we overthink how the magic of D&D might shape your campaign in surprising and unexpected ways. I'm Benjamin, game designer and writer. You can find me on Twitter at Sterling Vermin or the internet at large at sterlingvermin.com. And my name's Dane. I'm a dungeon master, podcaster, and voice actor. And I'm everywhere on the internet at Dane in Danger. Nice. This episode's uh, pretty nice. Till we get into the details. I think it's even nice when we do. Nice Till's Magic Aura. Nice Till's Magic Aura came to us almost in a dream. It, it, it came to us. Dane, you don't know. You don't know. Dane doesn't know. I was looking at doing the spell last season. And I was confounded by it. I looked down and I thought, there's something here. But I couldn't figure it out. Couldn't crack it. But I figured it out this season. And we're going to lay it on thick. Well, and it, it was kind of a journey to get here, right? We we were looking at other spells. And it just so happened that this spell kind of fit in with, what was it, Hollow? Hollow, Yeah. Hallow, Dispel, Evil and Good. I want to say it came up on, on something else too, but yeah, it was just we've been recording episodes with guests this season and a few guests have brought on spells that could be monkeyed with using Nysel's Magic Aura and that got me thinking about it and and then I found something truly game-breaking and so now we're doing it. I'm so excited. Yeah, it's it's it came to us through conjunction of other spells that led to the the breaking of right. of the world as as we like to do. So unlike a lot of our other episodes where we might bring up other spells for a um, for a little bit um, but then move on, like other spells that might work in conjunction with the spell we're talking about, this episode is really all about the way nice tools interacts with other spells. And I think once you hear the spell description, it's going to be pretty apparent why. Dane, tell us all about it. Nystal's Magic Aura is a second level illusion spell available to wizards. It takes one action to cast, has a range of touch, and a duration of 24 hours. The spell text says, You place an illusion on a creature or an object you touch, so that divination spells reveal false information about it. The target can be a willing creature or an object that isn't being carried or worn by another creature. When you cast the spell, choose one or both of the following effects. The effect lasts for the duration. If you cast this spell on the same creature or object every day for 30 days, placing the same effect on it each time, the illusion lasts until it is dispelled. False Aura You change the way the target appears to spells and magical effects, such as Detect Magic, that detect magical auras. You can make a non-magical object appear magical, a magical object appear non-magical, or change the object's magical aura so that it appears to belong to a specific school of magic that you choose. When you use this effect on an object, you can make the false magic apparent to any creature that handles the item. Mask You change the way the target appears to spells and magical effects that detect creature types, such as a paladin's divine sense, or the trigger of a symbol spell. You choose a creature type, and other spells and magical effects treat the target as if it were a creature of that type or of that alignment. A really niche spell, all in all. It's... Yeah. Yeah. Very specific. I think when I played a um, charlatan, I, I took this spell, you know, it's a good charlatan yeah, spell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For what you expect adventurers to do in D&D, it's like, why is this here? It's almost a spell for metagaming. Like, it's it's all mechanics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, not entirely. I mean, the, the first one, uh, the false aura part. Sure. You can see, like, story-wise, what you're supposed to do with that. Mask, I think you're totally right. Mask is like this weird meta magic effect in that like it only interacts with other spells that exist and alters the way those things work your wizard almost needs to know how dungeons and dragons itself codifies creatures the lore of the world needs to rely on the creature types yeah no that's funny i had i had not considered that but that does suggest 
that these creature types are somehow like an objective thing in the world that people know people know about. There's thermodynamics and then there are creature types. And you know that healing divination spells don't work on undead or whatever. You know, like like you just it's it seems super meta to me and it's super weird. <laughs> this is not a type of spell I've ever encountered before. Now, expected uses, this is this is kind of tough, right? Because because it's so niche and because it's so specific. What are what are some of the expected uses you came up with? I mean, like kind of what I was saying. I mean, like charlatan, charlatans could use it uh, to either pass off a magical object at, or a non-magical object as magical. Although just by the spell existing, it means that people are going to be kind of wary of buying things that appear magical. Like there's going to be some skepticism to magic items. Show me how it works instead of just using right, detect yeah. magic or right. identify yeah. or something. Yeah. So you're trying to make a lot of money quick. You cast Nystal's magic aura on a bunch of mundane objects to make a thousand gold as quick as you can. And you go into the shop and you, you use your most persuasive person to trick them into buying a whole bunch of colored water as potions, something like that. Right, right. I think that's like basically the expected use is that you sure. either sell an object that isn't magic as if it were, or maybe you abscond with a magical item and you cast this spell to make it appear non-magical so that less ostentatious when you're like trying to take it. In terms of the mask part of this, I was thinking that like if you have a very magic heavy campaign and you are being pursued by magic users that are using divination magic or using, mm -hmm. like it said, paladin effects. This is what you would use to get around that. You're in a city and you're trying to hide. Yeah. I mean, a lot of scrying doesn't rely on your creature type, so it doesn't help with that. Yeah. I'm really not sure exactly what they imagined the average player would use the mask component for. Could you mask a monstrosity or uh, some other non-creature type so that you can then heal it. Yes. We're already getting into unexpected uses, so let's just jump fully into this. First thing is just going to point out, as much as we love the ritual tag, uh, we love Until Dispelled as a duration even more. And when you cast this on the same item or creature for 30 days, it becomes Until Dispelled. So that facilitates a lot of things like we were talking about just a, just a minute ago. If you have a vampire friend you can just cast this on them every day for for a month. And then all of a sudden you can cure wounds, healing word, all that stuff. You can even, what I was thinking of is you could even raise dead on them mm. after they die because they're no longer undead. They don't, they don't count as undead for the purposes of the spell anymore, but we'll get into that a little bit later. The shorter section of the unexpected outcomes is to dig in on this false aura part, the part of this spell that affects items. To the extent that there's a magic item economy in a setting, this spell really complicates that a lot. As I suggested, in a setting where this spell is not commonly used, those kinds of transactions will just happen by using identify and detect magic to make sure something's magical. And then it'll be like, yeah, sure, I'll buy it. In a setting where this isn't the case, you're going to have to have a kind of more formal process where somebody casts dispel magic on, on the item enough times to ensure that it's not Nystal's magic aura on it and then cast identify it becomes a whole process and you can only really make a certain number of sales each day to make to you know to do that one of the things we love to do is create red tape and i think this is a way in which there's some red the spell uh creates more red tape is that now every magic item shop also has to employ a mage capable of casting dispel magic so that they can be sure that when they're looking at a magic item, it's really a magic item and not a regular old thing with Nysel's magic aura on it. Would this be analogous to a notary? You have to send it to the notary to... Absolutely, yeah. That's definitely what this is. Is This is like... Or when you watch those uh, pawn shop shows and they like take it to an expert to authenticate it, like that's what this is. Yeah, is you're, you're on an antiques roadshow, and yeah. and the, instead of uh, 20 minutes of them running down the history of the item, it's just a 20 minute video of them casting dispel magic <laughs> on it over and over again, and then at the end they're like, "Hey, yeah. you got it, you got it." 
it's real it's real and then they just start crying oh i knew it i knew it grandma was right on the flip side if you think about it there are a lot of people in the real world who are willing to buy something they know is fake because it looks oh, good yeah plenty of people buy jewelry that looks like it has certain kinds of stones or is made of a certain kind of metal um, that would be precious and it's not and so i think in the same vein you'd have plenty of people who want to wear want to have a magical diamond necklace or something and they can't afford to do that and so they're happy to just pay a mage to cast Nystal's magic aura on it enough so that it appears obviously magical to anyone who handles it you know that's pretty much as good yeah it's the cubic zirconium of spells yeah ex- that's exactly right you're still you're still paying for something but you're not paying through the nose for it right listeners if you have a, a high level spell that you think too rich for their own good more dollars than cents people in this world would try and duplicate using Na- Nysel's magic aura please let us know on twitter at dispel magic pod the only other thing that I, I thought of uh for false aura is that i i think it could be a fun basis for an adventure if you had a powerful legendary artifact that's been lost because somebody cast Nystals on it for 30 days to make it appear non-magical. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. And so then it's just like in some dungeon, it looks like some random old sword that like is weird because it's not rusty like everything else in this dungeon is. But you cast detect magic. It's not magical. So you've got no reason to take it home. And so it just sits there uh, for another hundred years or whatever. This is very Antiques Roadshow. This is very, <laughs> you know, it's just sitting in the in the garage sale and it's a Monet painting, magical Monet. I do like the idea of maybe being overly descriptive about a certain item that people encounter at like at first level. And then at like fifth or sixth level, they hear a legend about this ancient thing that's super magical, has all the same similarities of, of that thing they saw at first level. And the note taker of the group. Yeah, they're like, wait, <laughs> they're flipping through their notes. Uh, it has the <laughs> it has the, the gash on the hilt, just like they said from the from the tusk of the of the Oni. It's there. And then they rush back and they cast tech magic, but it's not magic. And they're it's like, not magic. Wait, though. what? Wait, what? So it really does open up that Antiques Roadshow moment where then where they're like, well, let's bring it back to town and figure this out. And. But the bulk of the oddities that the spell open up are not with the false aura component of the spell, but with the mask. So the avenue of shenanigans that this that the mask component opens up is that there are a large number of spells in D&D that only affect creatures of a specific type or that specifically don't affect creatures of a, of a specific creature type. So, for example, the, the healing spells we were talking about earlier, you can't heal a construct or an undead. But if you wanted to, you could cast Nystal's Magic Aura on them. And, and they have to consent to this. They have to agree to it because that the mask section specifically only affects willing creatures. Consent's important. Just as a brief caveat so that I don't have to either repeatedly explain it or put it in halfway through when you've already decided that this is kind of dumb. A lot of these use cases that I'm going to talk about, because we're going to shoot through them because there's so many. It's going to rely on either the player characters making a concentrated effort to communicate and engage, and engage with creatures to get their consent to cast Nysil's Magic Aura, or just casting Charm Monster on them so that they can <laughs> can jump in and, and, and get this done. So first up, let's talk about changing people into other things. Or, or not changing people into other things, but masking them as other things to magic. It's not really happening, but mechanics-wise, it's happening. Magic thinks it's happening. So if you turn somebody into an undead, it makes them immune to Abidalsum's Horrid Wilting, Blight, Anti-Life Shell, Phantasmal Force, and Sleep. Wow. If you turn somebody into a construct, it makes them immune to most of those things, not sleep, but everything else I just said. And also means that now you can repair cuts and tears to their body using mending. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. A, a niche interaction here. Is that if if you cast it for those 30 days and you made somebody permanently count as undead, they won't be able to be targeted by the spell Speak With Dead because they were a deceased undead creature and not a deceased humanoid. It also means that this creature cannot be returned to life uh, through the Raise Dead spell. 
because the raise dead spell specifically says it can't bring undead creatures back to life. So you're kind of making a gamble here. Yeah, I mean it's a good way to get around. Yeah, like it's a good way to get around a few spells if you know that you're going up against a wizard that just loves casting anti life shell or sleep. Great, go for it. But yeah, it could possibly mean that's their signature spells. Yeah, but it could mean that you're not going to be able to raise dead. Well, I could see this for where the crux of it is. Like if you fall asleep, then they enter your dreams somehow, you know, some, some plot device in where your party cannot at any cost go to sleep. Yeah. I mean, it also, charm person is a lot lower level spell than charm monster. Mm -hmm. And so if you were attempting to assassinate a very wealthy or powerful person who could easily have somebody raise dead on them if they died. Hmm. You could charm person them every day for 30 days to have them consent to Nystal's magic aura. And then after that month, you kill them. And then suddenly they're never coming back to life short of like maybe a wish spell or something. I see no uh, holes in this scheme whatsoever. You just charm person someone every day for a month and then you Nystal's magic aura so that they consent. It's, it's a foolproof plan that's actually i think we're not to get too in the weeds here because i hadn't even thought about this before but that's where a combination of disguise self charm person and modify memory oh my god you just like the king is just interacting with these random people he doesn't know every day and then getting those memories removed including the memory that he was ever charmed <laughs> in the first place sure Let's just step back uh, mechanics wise for you're sitting at the table and you're going through this with your DM and you're just like, okay, I guess we're making 30 rolls in a row. No, wait, let's compound that by three because there's also these other effects that we have to roll for, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, I would be so proud and so happy if a player brought this to me. I'd be, I actually don't even think I'd make him roll. I'd just be like, that's a great idea. And you're doing it. I'm going to let you do this it. This one time. So cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, always when it's something that would just ruin the game if they could do it forever, I do still want to reward people who come up with such a cool idea and let them do it. I'm imagining they're at the shopkeepers. They're at the shopkeeper and they're like, are you sure you can't take a hundred? You can't take a hundred gold off of that. And the shopkeeper's like, nope, can't do it. And they're like, all right, DM, we're doing the we're doing the month trick on this shopkeeper. Just for mundane little things that they just want to be able to do. Yeah, that gets um, really dark really quickly. I see a theme. <laughs> not that like assassination is ever not dark, but when it becomes like, this is how we deal with kind of minor obstacles. This is the manipulation version of a murder hobo. Like this is, <laughs> like, you disagree with us? If you turn people into a celestial, elemental, fey, fiend, or undead, you can also have them interact differently with detect evil and good, dispel evil and good, magic circle, and hallow. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details of how they interact differently because not necessarily, I can't think of, I, I haven't really thought of shenanigans that would come into play. Not even for hallow? You know what? We should maybe just do a whole episode on hallow. All right, let's do it. All right. Put it in the books. Let's do dispel evil and good while we're at it. Okay. Or, or I'm sorry, detect evil and good. If you say so. So the one thing, and actually this comes up in the episode where we talk about detect evil and good, is that using nice tools, you if it's like if you wanted to have a clandestine meeting with people you've never met before, but who are maybe co-conspirators with you, you could ask everybody to have nice tools cast on them and show up as a fae to a certain social event. And then when you go to the social event, everybody there can just cast a tactical and good. And they see all the other Fey in the room and they know sort of who to trust amongst the crowd. So this is a, this is a back pocket tool for the Wishinati to remain as anonymous as possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, for any kind of conspirator, like, I mean, this is a pretty low level spell combination. It's the second and first level spell. So this is really something that would be available to, most conspiracies becomes a lot safer because you don't even need to know the person's identity. Like I can be masked the entire time, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm a fae. And so presumably that's uncommon in your world. Like you wouldn't just have a fae walking around your yeah, party. Just a random arch fae comes to the party and it's just like, why is everyone talking to me about overthrowing the bourgeoisie? What is going on here? 
I just wanted to get drunk with mortals. I think Archfey would be into into that though. Oh yeah, no, they'd become part of it, and then you'd have a powerful ally, and and right. then everyone's a warlock of a sort all of a sudden. I think that's would be a pretty fun, pretty fun use of it. Also, pretty fun to unravel that that's what people are doing. It's kind of a mystery. This season on the Adventurer's Treasure Trail. When I was oh, probably about 10 years old, we found this in an old barn. The trail may lead to your village or hamlet. I saw you come in with this. I said, oh, that's a basket of my dreams. Our experts in magical and enchanted items can help you determine gold. It's a wonderful pot. That's amazing. Should I hug you now or later? <laughs> from mold. And it's cut out of the crotch of a tree. You never know what you'll find down the adventurer's treasure trail. So, you've brought us this exquisite goblet. Can you tell us anything about it? Uh, sure, I slayed several Etten who were all arguing which head would get to drink out of it. Interesting. Well, you may have wanted to let them. This item is in fact enchanted with Disintegrate. Oh, okay. Yes, this could get you one to 2,000 gold pieces at auction. <laughs> All right. So you said you quested after this item. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, my party and I were sent to retrieve this relic, and when we returned, the old wizard who sent us was nowhere to be found. I thought I'd bring it here and see what it does and uh, what we could get for it. <laughs> Judging by the patine and craft work on this fork, it most likely came from the capital city maybe a hundred to a hundred and fifty years ago. Hmm. The wizard said it was much more ancient than that, and it would m make up for the dead he owed us. We traveled miles and miles to find it and faced many perils along the way. Our magic user said this was the only magical item in the dungeon, so we grabbed it. I assumed it would transform into a, I, I don't know, mighty spear or something. <laughs> I, I lost my eye in the battle with the harpies guarding the entrance, and, uh, well, our cleric was consumed by the manticore inside. He was my brother. Right, well, you can see it's a fairly well-made fork. The silver handle has quite a nice inlay of oak leaves. The silver is fairly high quality, but unfortunately this is in fact a mundane item. It seems as if you've been nistled. Uh, nistled? Yes, it's just fork. Join us next time on The Adventurer's Treasure Trail. Okay, but Benjamin, let's get into the really good stuff. You want the good stuff? You're you've been sitting on you've been sitting on the the wild and wacky parts. Let's let's it's lower. Let's get hot and heavy. If you can agree to get a monster to let you target them with nice tools, there's a there's a couple there's a couple fun tricks. You you you, you target a monster with nice tools, and you make them count as a humanoid. There there's two things you can do. The first is that they're now a valid target for simulacrum. Simulacrum targets a beast or a... I had to look up what the difference between clone and simulacrum were to like get that back in my head. But simulacrum is actually quite powerful. You are creating a replica of a humanoid or a beast that's got all of its stats, but half its maximum hit points, and is totally loyal to you. It just listens to you and other creatures you designate. So with Nystals, you can make anything a humanoid or beast. So anything becomes a valid target for simulacrum. You want a beholder? You got a beholder. You want a Tarrasque? You got a Tarrasque. You want a demigod? You got a demigod. You just have to figure out how to convince them to let you target them with nice tools first. You got to be real convincing. That persuasion role's got to be real high. <laughs> Beholders, I think, are supposed to be incredibly narcissistic so I do think you could kind of play to that and be like, wouldn't the world be better if there were two of you? If you let me cast this spell, 
There will be. I can do it. I can make that happen. The Tarrasque will be a little bit harder, I think, to get to agree to being cast uh, by Nysols. And then also Simulacrum takes 12 hours to cast. So you got to like both get the Tarrasque to agree to be targeted by Nysols and then also stay chill for 12 hours while you cast Simulacrum. But, you know. Stay chill are, with a Tarrasque. Yeah, these are these are just minor details when it comes to having your own pet Tarrasque. So. And please, please, when you're dealing with the with the beholder, don't tell them that it'd be a dream come true. You know what I mean? Don't go throwing that around because <laughs> then you will have a, a second beholder and they won't be they won't be loyal to you. I'll tell you that much. Really relying on people knowing a lot about the metaphysics behind a beholder. We're we are a rules lawyer podcast. If people don't know that beholders reproduce by dreaming about themselves, then what are we doing here? Everyone read a book. The other cool thing you can do if you use nice tools to make a monster count as a humanoid is that you can kill the monster who is now a valid target for reincarnation where it will reincarnate into an actual humanoid body and just be a humanoid forever. Does reincarnate only reincarnate into a humanoid body? <laughs> reincarnate only reincarnation only works on humanoids and it reincarnates them into another humanoid body, a random humanoid uh, <laughs> body. <laughs> and so if you can talk this, I mean, and, and that's actually, I think could be a fun, fun kind of uh, adventure where like, maybe there's a monster who wants to be human. Yeah, you, you got a you got a Madron who's always wanted to have a soul, and now you've got a Pinocchio situation, and you're the blue fairy. Right. Read a book, everybody. So I mentioned how Simulacrum, you could turn somebody into a human or a beast to to make them a valid target for Simulacrum. But there are a few other spells that have a fun interaction if you turn somebody into a beast. The first is speak with animals. There's no reason to know the spell tongues when you can turn anyone into a beast and then cast speak with animals that you can talk to beasts. Universal translator. Yeah. You've got your, I mean, it's a, it's extra steps, but there's, it's kind of like broadly speaking, more utility. Other thing is, or another spell is beast sense. Beast sense lets you cast the spell on a beast and then you can sense things through its like eyes and ears. I think it's like for 24 hours or something. So this is a great way to observe things remotely through your friend's sense. Like, let's say your friend has to go into a dangerous situation and you guys need to know if you need to move in to extract them in some way. This That would be a good a good spell combination. I just had a great idea for it. You get your rogue to infiltrate a place where you need, like the spellcaster needs to be able to see the target to scry on them later. Or mm-hmm. they need to be able to see what they look like for a disguise self spell or something like that. So you oh, codify yeah. you your go. infiltrator mm-hmm. right. to be able to get in and then you be sense on your infiltrator so that the yeah. one with the spells can have that info clear in their mind. And then that, that makes the chance of misfiring on any of those things. Yeah. Way That's, less. Yes. Oh my God. Also, we we talked about this in in some other episode, but it also means that you can see creatures. And so any spell that says creatures that you can see, you can You're now casting cast spells through your friend. <laughs> yes. Like I'm on the outside of this building, my friend's inside, but I'm able to cast magic missile on the person they're looking at because I can see them now because I'm looking through my friend using beast sense and nice tools magic aura. Long distance sniper. Yeah, I really it was really it was scry that. that we it was scry that we did this. Yeah, with it was because scry that we, you yeah. could see through the scry spell, and yeah. and then you could cast magic missile that way. But okay. doing it this way, you can do it this way too through your friend. Yeah. And then magic missile flies through their eyes. That's how like that's how the magic <laughs> missile gets to them. Is it black? out of the it's, out of the iris of their eyes? That's right, and it, it it's like a a cyclops laser beam. <laughs> Three short bursts. This is fun. This is a fun spell. It's a fun spell. And we're about to get into the second weirdest thing you can do with this spell. Not even the weirdest? 
not even the weirdest. The second weirdest thing you can do with Nice Souls is you can cast Nice Souls on a creature to treat it like a beast, not because you want to do anything with that creature. Let's say I turn Dane into, uh, with Nice Souls, I make Dane count as a beast. Mm, I'm a beast, okay. baby. That means that when I cast Polymorph on other people, Dane is now an eligible thing to turn into. <laughs> Because Dane is a beast and Polymorph lets me turn other people into beasts. Who needs Disguise Self? Who needs it? Right. So the, so there, there's a, another thing where you can Disguise pers- or disguise Self, Charm Person, Nice Tools Magic Aura on the King, make him a beast, and then cast Polymorph on your buddy. So now you've got two people that both look like the King. And I don't know. I'm sure shenanigans well, ensue. You got no, there's I could, a lot. I you could, could see this happening for royalty or nobility or something to have a body double. This is an unexpected way to have a convincing body double that isn't just if there are well trod paths to tricking people into thinking they're a different person. This is this is really coming at them sideways. I, I think just getting to this point before we go on before we get into the originally planned world changing effect of the spell it occurs to me looking at all the things we've looked at so far that this spell would so profoundly change the world it's maybe the only spell that i would consider like removing from the game just banning yeah yeah because of all the stuff because of things like turning someone into a beast and then everybody else can polymorph into that person just a whole fleet of kings. Yeah. <laughs> but which one's the real one? Because, like, it would be fun for that to happen once. But, like, once, like, in a setting, if you can imagine a setting where people have figured out all of these things, mm-hmm. I can't I can't even think through what this looks like anymore. An amazing masquerade party. But, but instead of wearing costumes, you're <laughs> polymorphing into each other. Well, but even the simulacrum spells mean that there would be like kind yeah. of wizard kings, like the combination of nice tools and simulacrum means that there'd be like these kind of wizard kings that have these vast menagerie of like terrifying monsters that are all completely obedient to them. And the only difference between them and the original versions is that, the, is that they have half as many hit points. And when it's a t- Tarask. I hadn't thought about this, but to just one last thought on the simulacrum, when you create a when you create a simulacrum, the only difference between it and the original is that it's a construct, which normally makes it ineligible to be targeted by simulacrum. But mm. using nice tools, you can make it count as a beast, and so you can just keep simulacruming the same thing over and over again. So eventually, you have an army of one HP Tarasks. Oh my God, Jacob's ladder. We're going down um, the rabbit hole. Yeah. No, we've, uh, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think whether or not they should. So far, we've been Nystal's magic aura, but when are we going to get Nastal's magic aura? Let's get nasty with it. All right. Let's get into Nastal's magic aura right now. This, although now I'm kind of thinking Simulacra might have been the Pokemonification of d d <laughs> But this is another version of Pokemonification of D&D. Uh, copyright, Dispel Magic, po- Pokemonification, yes. TM, 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 TM. Step one, find a monster you want to make friends with. Okay, I have, I have, this, uh, I have this fire giant okay. that I want to make friends with. Step 1.5. <laughs> if the monster's intelligence is higher than three, you need to blast it with Feeble Mind or sick an intellect devourer on it. Because for the, all of this to work, you need its intelligence to be three or less. So I've disguised this intellect devourer as a hat, and I'm like, hey, yep. hey, fire giant. I got, you, got this you this hat. hat. Okay, yeah. great. Step two, do a diplomacy or cast charm monster. Which, if One you're giving him a hat. diplomacy, please. Yeah, if, if, you're, if you gave him a hat, I would say you're doing a diplomacy. So you've got your fire... Fire giant who put on a hat and is inexplicably confused. This uh, Stenson feels real snug. Um. Step three, cast Nystal's magic aura to make the monster count as a beast for the purposes of spells. No. Okay. So to 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 recap up to this point, you've got a monster. <laughs> <Let's> go from- <laughs> you've got a monster 
You've, nice. you've done everything you need to make its intelligence three or less. Got a nice hat. You've 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 gotten it to the point to where it consents to being cast Nysel's magic aura on it to make it. Sure, I'm a cow now. I'm a cow okay. now. You cast Awaken on the monster to raise its intelligence back up to ten, to grant it a language that you know, and to make it charmed by you for the next thirty days. Oh wow! I suddenly know Elvin. Yeah, so you've got your fire giant that suddenly knows this knows a language that you do. Its intelligence is ten, and it's friendly to you for at least thirty days. And I've got a nice hat. That's where there's one line from the awaken spell that makes this uh, the Pokemonification of D anD. d When the charm condition ends, the awakened creature chooses whether to remain friendly to you based on how you treated it. While it was charmed. So as long as you are nice to that hill giant for 30 days, while it's charmed by you and and it kind of has to be nice to you, then it's going to continue to be friendly to you on into the future. And you've now gotten a fire giant was maybe not the best example because it's an intelligent creature already. But if you picked any of the like displacer beast, bullets, any of these monsters that are normally Gibbering mouther gibbering mouth or any of these monsters that are normally unintelligent um and horrifically dangerous to to human life it's now tame it's de- you've like it's it's kind of you can domesticate any animal or any any, any kind of um monster in D using this simple 5.5 step <laughs> process and i've got this great hat Right, and then you've got to take the hat off him because you don't want to keep. Uh, no, you don't want to keep draining. Yeah, yeah. So you're you're talking mimics. You're yeah. talking oozes. You're talking you're... gelatinous cube farms. The, the what occurs to me is that this doesn't apply to awaken. So this is another way in which simulacrum and and this method are kind of competing with with one another. Is that with simulacrum mm. you can make you can make your simulacrum also obey the commands of somebody else. So in that sense, you can like be selling these mm-hmm. copies to other people. Like, hey, sure. do you want your own personal owlbear? Oh, okay, boy. let me cast simulacrum for you and then you can walk out of here with an owlbear. So I, I, I do feel like we're treading on the side of slavery though. Um, if these are well, intelligent creatures. They're not, but well, yeah, but they're not, um, they're, they've got an intelligence 10. They can speak a language, and they're friendly to you. They're not. It doesn't say anything about. Um, they're sentient. <laughs> well, they don't become subservient. Self awareness. They're, they're, they're not. Yeah. Well. Well. They, well. I think that's that's implied by an intelligence of ten, because that's as okay. intelligent. That's as intelligent as as an average person. Are we making a bunch of AI chat bots? <laughs> simulacrum. Simu- simulacrum. Yes, is kind of like subjugated AI, where they like are mostly kind of. They like are intelligent, but they have to follow your commands. These awakened companions are these awakened uh, versions of monsters are not like that because they might be friendly to you, but they still kind of maintain their own kind of will, autonomy. volition, and yeah, mm-hmm. and autonomy. So I could see, I could see like a kind of like what would you how would you put it like um, a kind of economy that revolved around like sort of simulacrums being sold and then people being like, oh, here's a more humane, mm. awakened, like a monster. You actually have to be nice to it for it to work for you. You have to have it's, some buy-in. A, you have to yeah. have some emotional buy-in, some actual legitimate bond with this twig blight that you've just befriended. But, so the combination of, of, of the simulacrum exploit using nice tools and the awaken exploit using nice tools really means that like there's not a great reason for monsters not to be embedded like really deeply intrinsic in all, yeah like in all aspects of civilization like they should be there, there. was a there was a, a episode or a, a part of a, a critical role campaign where mm-hmm. a I think it was a, a gin was enslaved under the city to make their plumbing work, uh-huh. to make their uh, running water work. It was either that or, or a water elemental. So, I mean, 
you now have elementals that are yeah. running I your mean, city. Right. I mean, if you wanted a much less morally uh, awful situation, casting some simul- out simulacrum on a water elemental that you've convinced should be a beast for a little bit, then you've got just simulacrums of the of the water elemental because you don't really care how many hit points it has. It's just mm-hmm. running water for you. So yeah, so every D and D. Oh my god, I didn't even think about that. So every D and D setting should have like running water, plumbing, plumbing, plumbing is not an issue. Actually, there you go. There's uh, air elementals, so like easy to create underground or underwater uh, settlements because you just create mm-hmm. simulacrums of air elementals that are just like constantly blowing out fresh air in underwater enclosed places. Man, at the <laughs> It really blows things up. It re- and we're yeah, only I mean, this, three episodes yeah. in. This is another. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so this is kind of why I said if you were going to remove any spell from D&D because of what we talk about. Get rid Nystals, of Nastals. Ma- N- Nastals might be it because it's you will. Nastals be nasty, though. Get it out of here. Well, thank you all for listening. If you have any other crazy world breaking tips or tricks that you want to uh, share based on Nastal's magic aura, uh, please send them over. Uh, We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you again after your next long rest. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Dispel Magic. If this has inspired any ideas for your game, or you have another take on today's topic, please let us know on Twitter at Dispel Magic Pod. You can find Benjamin at Sterling Vermin and Dane at Dane in Danger. Thank you to Slim Mittens for our cover art, produced by Benjamin Huffman, produced and edited by Dane Fox McGraw. Mm-hmm.